Hi, welcome back, um, I hope, um, to another uh, episode of uh, a series of interviews and conversations I'm hosting on this YouTube channel with um, academics, with researchers that I'm a huge fan of, whose uh, work I assign in my courses and uh, who I and I hope everyone would like to get to know just a little bit better. And, and today um, uh, we have a panel conversation with three scholars who in recent years have been working and researching and publishing on the working lives of freelance journalists in different parts of the world, in, in Canada, in the United States, in the UK, um, in Sweden and the Netherlands. And what makes their work so uh, uh, interesting and inspiring and promising in lots of different ways is the fact that they don't just focus on, you know, the, the, the precarious nature of work in, uh, as a freelancer, of trying to make ends meet under often exploitative or impossible circumstances, um, but they focus on I instances of resistance of um, making it work um, despite or even thanks to the impossible odds that, that, that journalists are facing, f focusing on how journalists still are able to produce their best work, best in terms of what they feel is important work, um, um, despite the precarious nature of uh, uh, working in the media today. And uh, it's that kind of spirit that I uh, that that really inspires me and my work in this area. And I would love uh, for you to get to know a little bit better. So, as guests today, we have first and foremost Maria Norbeck. Uh, Maria Norbeck is an associate professor in business administration at the University of Gothenburg, and she's also the director of the Work and Employment Research Center there, studying. Uh, the changing nature of work in general and focusing on the media industries in particular. Second, we have Errol Salomon. Uh, Errol is a, a senior lecturer at the University of Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. Uh, his position is in digital media and communication at the Department of Media and Performance of the School of Music, Humanities and Media there. And before that, because he just recently um, um, accepted the position in, in the UK, he was working in the United States um, uh, first uh, as a visiting scholar at uh, the Annenberg School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and then as a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the uh, University of Minnesota. And uh, originally he's a freelance writer in Canada and from Canada. And also a, a freelance writer and independent researcher is our third guest, which is Erwin van het Hof. Erwin is at the moment doing his PhD uh, at, uh, at my university, the University of Amsterdam. Um, and he's a, f a freelance writer and, and, and researcher, recently uh, finishing a book uh, together, uh, a Dutch language book, together with his uh, uh, friend and colleague, uh, Sjoerd Arends, called The New Journalist, The New Journalist, uh, focusing on uh, how uh, independent investigative journalists in the Netherlands make it work. And he's the host of a podcast called Future News Work that you can find on, on Spotify and elsewhere, uh, interviewing uh, the academics that he, he studies uh, for his research that are writing on uh, the future of journalism. And uh, with Erwin, Errol and Maria, we talk about their recent work, about how journalists are coping in the current pandemic and what the way forward is in researching and teaching the nature of work, not just in journalism, and perhaps not even just in the media industry, but work in general. Um, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And uh, please like, subscribe, follow, uh, share these videos, use them in your courses and classes and in your, in your work if you can and if you, if you want to as much as you want to. And uh, I'll hope I'll see you uh, at another of these uh, vlogs on my channel soon. Well, thanks um, so much for, for, for being here in different time zones. In, 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 we're in four different parts of the world. Um, um, really good to, to, to see all of you. Um, and, and I think... I mean, we're all here because we care about what happens to journalists and specifically freelance journalists, um, and, and which almost requires us to start this conversation off to talk about the role of freelancing in this corona context. 
Um, and, and, and I would say, the, I mean, to work as a journalist in this context, because there's two things going on here. On the one hand, you're covering a global crisis, but you're also part of it. That seems to be uh, an interesting uh, uh, dilemma. And, and, uh, and the second is that the first people to get dumped, to get budgeted away, to get dropped by the wayside in every single news organization around the world were the freelancers. Um, and uh, so we're sort of adding insult to injury almost, like making it doubly hard, uh, uh, you would imagine. Now, we've just seen a couple of studies released just the other day as featuring surveys among journalists and editors, uh, asking them about sort of how the pandemic has impacted their work. And the, the thing that really jumps out of these surveys is uh, an intensifying workload and a lot of stress and, um, and, and, and mental health issues dealing with trying to make it work, surviving, dealing with the crisis, reporting on it, having family members that are ill or might get ill, kids, all of that. Now, given all of our concerns with, with the working lives of these men and women, I mean, how do, you, how do you see the work of journalists in general and freelancers in particular in this context, perhaps where you live uh, uh, among the people that you're in touch with? Uh, what are your observations uh, right now? Maria, can we, can we start with you in, in, uh, in Sweden? Yeah, so uh, yes, I'm in Sweden. Um, so one of the things that you already mentioned, Mark, was, was uh, how, how freelancers were dropped. So basically they lost their work from one day to another, their jobs just dried up. So obviously those who still have jobs, they experience work intensification and fatigue and all those things. Whereas those journalists, usually the freelancers who are unfortunate enough to not have work, they experience unemployment basically. And, and also it's very obvious also because this, the Swedes, I don't know about in other countries, but the Swedish state has had a, a rather large um, corona package where they kind of pumped in money in all sorts of companies called um, short term work something Kurzarbeit in, in, in German what what's the is there a, a, an English word for this perhaps for short term work or short term work okay basically yeah. Yeah. and it was given to all those with with a limited company and most of the freelancers have not limited companies they have their own firms and they were not eligible for this kind of state support right. so it's also very obvious that the the larger companies that the the large firms in sweden got some state relief and fairly advanced state relief and a lot lot and lot of tax money went into this whereas the the self-employed basically got left by the wayside so so it's been very hard on especially freelancers even though i understand that also employed journalists are experiencing a lot of, of difficulties and aaron what's the situation in the netherlands well, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, people who work for themselves have been given approximately 1500 euro uh, for each month. They uh, did not make any or hardly, hardly any money. I think this lifeline has helped a lot of freelancers. But in my near environment, I hear often stories about freelancers who work in newsrooms uh, on a freelance basis. So they do the, uh, news shifts or uh, editor shifts or something like that. And they were dropped immediately. Mm. So uh, a lot of people, uh, yeah, they, they lost a significant chunk of their work. Yeah. And the situation uh, really reminded me of a paper you, you sent me uh, the other day. Uh, it was a paper about how people in it Italy responded to the first uh, lockdown. Uh, the researchers interviewed 60 people uh, who had not journalistic jobs, but just uh, regular jobs. And they suddenly they had, they had to work from home. Mm -hmm. And the interviewers uh, uh, looked at various boundaries of work that changed due to this lockdown. And two of these boundaries were, the, the first one was uh, a shift of external risks, risks and internal solutions. So they noticed that people with regular jobs who were suddenly put in lockdown, they uh, started to feel individually responsible to make it work despite the situation. And that really reminded me of the situation of freelance journalists I have interviewed before the COVID crisis. Right. So it kind of exemplified 
uh, what freelancers are always, the stress they are always facing when they're doing their work. And the second boundary uh, was a blurring between the professional and private life. Mm -hmm. Because the people in the Italian survey said, I have nowhere to go to. I have to work from home. Uh, and there is no there is no boundary between my work and, and my private life. But almost all freelancers I interviewed, I wrote a book about freelancing. And for this book, I interviewed 50 freelancers. They almost always worked from home. Just so they permanently faced this blur blurring between professional and private life. Huh. And the the uh, uh, conclusion from the Italian study is, of course, this is detrimental for your mental health. This is not a good way to build a career. This is not a good way to, to live a healthy and fulfilling life. So I found it quite disturbing that what I found as a, a, a normal way of, of, of conducting freelance journalism is in another study which has nothing to do with uh, freelancing or journalism described as something inherently unhealthy and troublesome. Right. Yeah. 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 So the, the pandemic show makes, makes everybody feel what freelancers have felt for <laughs> quite some time uh, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a way. Errol, how's it for you? I mean, I know you work in the UK, but you, you, you live at the moment in, in Canada and you, that's of course where you're from. Yeah. Um, and I, I can also talk about the, the North American context more broadly because mm -hmm. um, up until earlier this year, I was working in the United States. Yes. And um, in fact, I'd like to start there because um, the, the freelancers that I had been interviewing and talking to while I was working in, in the US had been facing their own crisis as a result of uh, a legislation in California called AB5. And AB5 in California um, was a, a legislation that was meant to help convert um, misclassified gig workers into full-time employees. And one of the uh, uh, unintended uh, effects of that uh, legislation was that it brought in freelance journalists. So this was before COVID-19 right. uh, came into being. And um, essentially the legislation as it was originally written limited the number of pieces that a freelancer could submit in a 12 month period to the same uh, journalistic outlets. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, some companies in California were getting a little bit scared about um, using freelancers altogether. So freelancers were already starting to lose work as a result of that. And that's not even, to take into consideration the fact that freelancing, as we all know, has long been precarious. So the, the inherent precarity as a result of freelancing was made more precarious by AB5 and then even more precarious when COVID-19 hit. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is just happening in California. How does this impact anyone else? Well, because there are so many media and journalistic outlets um, in California and freelancers don't necessarily have to be based in the, the city or even country in which they work. This had uh, an, an impact on freelancers elsewhere in the United States, freelancers in Canada and freelancers elsewhere around the world and based companies. Um, and, and going to the Canadian situation as, um, as we've seen in other countries uh, EI uh, unemployment benefits had been extended to, to freelancers, but there's been so many restrictions on how freelancers can access these benefits. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, essentially what we've been seeing is that COVID-19 has made freelancing even more precarious than it, it already was. Mm -hmm. so, so this theme of of precar precariousness or, or precarity, as it sometimes is, it's called in literature, is, is obviously a structural issue in, in all of your work. Um, um, we start often our research on atypical work in general and freelancing in particular from a perspective of precariousness. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of our work is, is, in, is inspired or influenced by this notion of like, yeah, I mean, how does precarious play a role in people's lives and people's working lives and how do they 
what kind of strategies and tactics do they develop to 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 make it work and and how can we effectively theorize uh, around this issue and I, I was wondering um if you could all talk a little bit about like how this issue of precariousness and precarity fundamentally informs the kind of questions you ask the kind of the, the, the way that that ins what, what inspires you to do the kind of work that you do um, um and 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 perhaps following up on that um I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about is there anything that in the in the literature on work and precarity that you find that it's missing that 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 that, 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 that where are the gaps because it, it is a, a large body of work that I think only relatively recently has been discovered, if you will, in the field of media studies and journalism studies. But, and, and, and of course, you are some of the sort of pallbearers for, for, for this. Um, so how does it inspire your work? And uh, what, if anything, um, might be still be missing uh, from, from this perspective? Now, Errol, you wanna start? I mean, you finished just now, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um... In terms of the the first part to uh, your question, the strategies that workers are using to to make it work, so to speak, um, working in precarity, um, I'll actually answer the, the second part as well. That the gap and the strategy are the collective organizing strategies um, mm -hmm. that workers are taking as a way to cope with precarious working conditions. And we have seen some work, Nicole Cohen uh, has been doing work in this area. But what I really find it, is the gap methodologically it, is looking at this from a discursive and rhetorical perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just about uh, the collective organizing strategies that are taking, but what kind of language um, are workers using to describe themselves um, and the ways that they resist to precarious conditions. So on the one hand, scholars like Nicole Cohen, uh, Vincent Mosco, Catherine McKercher had looked at this on a macro and, and meso level scale. So these are the organizations that are um, helping to strategize and to protect freelance workers and other media workers. But in my work, one way of identifying the gaps is, is by bringing together the macro, meso, and micro level by looking at the, the discursive strategies that uh, workers and uh, unions, professional associations are using to contest precarious conditions. Um, well, but in talking about freelancers, I wanna go back to the case of AB5 in, in California and connect that uh, to some of the other work that I had done in the past, because I find it really interesting how freelancers, um, unlike other media workers even, tend to negotiate the sense of individualism and mm -hmm. collectivity that, um, that, that seems to be inherent in their work. So on the one hand, they're proud to see themselves as individuals, but on the other hand, they don't want to get exploited. So they seem to become activists at, at particular moments when precarity is really strong, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but then in between those moments, so when they resolve the particular issues that uh, they want to resolve, then they go back to being the individuals that they were before. And that's something that we can see that's different between even other journalistic workers who have long been in uh, trade unions around the world in different countries. But with freelancers, it just seems to be what, I, what I've referred to in my work as temporary convergence. So mm -hmm. building on what uh, Moscow and McKercher have talked about labor convergence um, right. as being a long-term strategy. Uh, in terms of freelancers, I tend to see that as more of a, a, as a short-term strategy that freelancers use to negotiate between the individual um, things that they like about freelancers and the need to collectively organize in order to protect those things that they like about being individuals who can work for themselves and have autonomy and control over their work. So, so sorry, before I go, turn to Maria and Erwin, just a quick question, Errol. Like, what is it that so much of the work in this area 
comes from Canadian scholars. I mean, it's Greg Peter, it's Catherine McCurker, it's Vincent Mosco, it's Nicole, of course, it's your work. I mean, there's so much coming out of uh, from Canadian scholarship. I mean, it, 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 I mean, <laughs> how would you explain that? I mean, Catherine Mosk and, and Vincent, of course, have really uh, been doing this for quite a while. But but and, and Greg as well. But but uh, what is what is it about Canada that inspires this kind of critical work? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Mark. Uh, I've been thinking <laughs> about that a lot too because. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I think the, the broader thing, uh, if we look at Canadian communication studies in comparison to other places around the world, there's an inherent um, drive to do critical cultural work. Mm -hmm. um, and just comparing that to when I was working in the United States, critical cultural studies in the United States is a, is a very small field mm -hmm. within communication studies and it's often marginalized. In, right. in Canadian communication studies, you'll see quite the opposite. So there's already this inherent um, interest in uh, critical approaches to, to media studies. So I think that's where the, the labor part comes in. Um, and, and then just also the uh, inherent drive toward interdisciplinary work that we see in Canadian uh, communication studies. So it's both those, uh, the, the interest in uh, critical cultural studies and interdisciplinary work that really makes this a Canadian phenomenon. And, and does the proximity of the big Southern neighbor have something, because I, I the, there's a similar story to be told of Latin American scholarship and in, in communication studies that has sort of an intrinsic critical perspective. Yes, ex exactly. And, and that is, is really how uh, Canadian communication studies has had had started. And, and that's one of the reasons why um, the cultural is so important in Canadian communication studies, everything from pol policy to uh, traditional cultural identity studies. It's about positioning Canadianness um, mm. against um, the identity of Americanism and the United States. So right. um, Canadian media policy is all about protecting Canadian culture, um, promoting national identity and that sort of thing. Right. Thanks. Thanks for indulging me in that. The, but but uh, appreciate the, the perspective there. Uh, Maria, turning back to the original question, how precarity and precariousness inspires your work specifically and what if anything might be missing or something that you really uh, love uh, focusing on in that context yeah so i'm not actually a, a media and communication scholar right. i i um well i sometimes uh, i i uh, try to be or i pretend to be but i'm at the <laughs> business school and i my phd is in is in organization theory so it's um more towards sociology of, of labor and sociology of work. And I'm interested in how, kind of how, how work is organized. And so I tend to study the media industry because I think um, in a sense, the media industry is like the canary in the mine. So what happens in the media industry, it's fairly extreme in terms of labor and organizing of work, but I think it has an interesting story to tell about all kind of contemporary organizing of work. So. For me, uh, precarious work, um, well, it, it turned out that it was a, a, com a convenient or, or very good, uh, freelancers were a very good example. I mean, good example from the, from the perspective of, of research, not a normative good example, but, but uh, to study uh, precariousness and precarity. But I see this kind of ongoing precariousness of professional work um, in, in many professions. Uh, and my my kind of take on it was that there was a lot of talk when I started uh, a couple of years ago writing about precarious work. There was a lot of talk about gig work, obviously, and about platform work and uberization of work. Uh, but I think interestingly, is interestingly, it's not only the the kind of um, less edu um, the, the the kind of uh, blue collar work or or lower educated workforce uh, that experiences this, but also journalists, uh, university teachers, uh, uh, medical doctors, um, all these kind of professions that, that used to be the elite and have very good working conditions. Uh, we can see that there is an, an ongoing continuous precarization, if you will. 
Um, so I think that's interesting. And I think the media is, as I said, an, a, a kind of illustrative example of a, a kind of much more ongoing uh, trend in this kind of neoliberal uh, competitive capitalism financialization of all work where you try to push the costs for all work onto the individual worker, whereas the employer has less and less obligations towards uh, the employees and so on. Um, in terms of your second question, I think what's interesting and what I think we can develop more is that there are kind of, and you alluded to this, Mark, you said that there is both this kind of um, subjective idea of, of precariousness, this kind of inherent ontological understanding of life and society as precarious in a sense, mm -hmm. more, the more kind of Butler understanding, and then the more kind of um, tangible labor understanding of precarious work. So um, precarious employment, low wages, uh, unsafe work and so on. And I think it's interesting that these are both really uh, relevant things to study. And I think they need to be combined because I think they kind of feed into each other. And there are a couple of, of studies now, just general kind of organization management studies where, where they try, start to understand how this kind of ontological way of understanding work life as precarious also feeds into these other things. Oh. I mean, specifically a, a, a remark that you make in one of your more recent papers, um, you talk about um, uh, different coping strategies of, of, of freelance journalists uh, in, in this overwhelming precarious context. And, and, and one of these strategies you call, you, you use the label as a, um, artistic journalism. Uh, I thought that was that was really interesting. Is uh, um, I mean because it, and the reason why I'm saying it, mentioning it now, is also because, like I mean, uh, uh, and what Aaron said earlier that you know, professionals in general are now perhaps in the Corona context experiencing something that freelancing freelancers have always sort of worked through. And as you say, Maria, like what workers in the media in, in general and freelancers in particular. Our experiencing is can be seen as sort of a, a touchstone, perhaps even a benchmark for what is happening in a broader economy um, and and by extension in 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 in, in society, um, and and everyone seems to be now experiencing what artists are experiencing. <laughs> have have you know? There's there's never been a different situation for artists at all, and um, and so so that that I was triggered by that. Uh, reflection when I read your comment about artistic journalism as, as a coping strategy but I think in the paper if I understand it correctly it had something to do on the one hand with the way you organize your professional identity but on the other hand also the relationship with the stuff that you make uh, the work the the, the the so for the story the your reporting that you do would, would you mind just talking a little bit about that I wanted to make sure that I understood it correctly because I thought it was such an evocative concept yeah, so I think um, I think there were two, if I remember this correctly, <laughs> not, I have like a, a, the memory of a goldfish, you know, I remember things in, for three seconds and then I do something else, but sorry, um, it could be my age as well. <laughs> uh, but I think it, um, so well, I also interviewed about 50 freelancers in the Gothenburg area, uh, just to give you some context. And, the, and they had different coping strategies, obviously, to, to cope with this. And, and I think what you're referring to, Mark, is that you, you, there were two very interesting op opposing strategies. So one, you could be like a, an artist and you could suffer for your art and you could be really poor and you could, uh, you know, yeah. not, not uh, you, you didn't have a house, you didn't have a car, you never went on vacation. You, you basically lived hand to mouth, but you did your art. And that, so the, the kind of classic struggling artist thing, or you became an entrepreneur selling any good. You could have sold the, uh, you know, uh, footballs or whatever you made. And, and so you happened to make journalism and you sold it. And uh, as soon as, as long as people paid you, you could write basically anything. So it, there wasn't a, a, basically a sense of there's something called journalism and there's something called PR and there are straight lines between them. But basically I produce texts where I, may, I take photos and I can take photos of anything kind of. So those were the kind of two, two ways to, to cope with precariousness. Ah, 
Fascinating. Th- thanks, thanks, Maria. Well, that leads me to 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 your work, Erwin. I mean, also, of course, the, the question for you is like, how does precarity inspire and form your research, and what, if anything, is 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 missing? And and following up what Maria just said um, about you know either suffer for your art as a journalist, you know, um, uh, very specifically and narrowly defined, or be a bit more entrepreneurial, which means you know uh, anything goes in order to make it work. It, it seems. To align quite closely to something you and and your co-author Shurta found in your book, the, this distinction between what you call traditional and modern freelancing, right? Where the traditional freelancer just wants to do quality journalism and therefore is suffering because there's little or no money, and especially now there isn't. And and the the modern freelancer is a bit more flexible and entrepreneurial and and um, um, finds lots of different ways to 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 market uh, their skill set and their knowledge. Um, um, so is is that how precarity in, inspires your work to look for those that kind of uh, those kind of transitions as well, or how how can we understand it? Well, um, in our work, we are always looking for ways in which individuals make precarity productive. So uh, all journalists we interviewed saw that they were in a, a precarious condition. Mm-hmm. But how do we do we respond to that? Mm-hmm. So in our interviews, we made the, the rough distinction between uh, what you said, the, the traditional and the contemporary uh, freelancer. And we found that they had uh, different mental models in which they approached the field of journalism. For instance, the traditional uh, mental model, uh, traditional journalist um, uh, relates professionalism in journalism closely to legacy media institutions. So what legacy media institutions say uh, is proper journalism, that's what they are trying to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another assumption of a traditional uh, journalist could be, for instance, a strong self-identification with a specific mode of com- communication. So traditional journalists, they, they said to us, uh, I am a writer and I'm always going to be a writer. Hmm. Another, an, uh, another assumption of a traditional journalist is for instance, uh, a journalist is something that you are, not something that you do. So it's closely related to your own identity. And the final assumption of a traditional journalist is uh, the rejection of the identity of being an entrepreneur. So I am not an entrepreneur, uh, or I do not have a need to have some kind of entrepreneurial spir- spirit, but I am a journalist, so I have to make journalism. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, we found what we call the contemporary or modern uh, freelance journalist. They have uh, entirely different assumptions about what their work is. So the equ- equivalence of the assumptions they have as opposed to the traditional uh, assumptions are, for instance, uh, journalism has core principles, but no clear boundaries. So within certain constraints, anything goes, which opens a lot more possibilities to to distribute and make your work. Uh, and, and another assumption is, for instance, personal values uh, are a leading factor to create uh, in integration of journalism. So I'm not looking not looking at the demands of legacy news institutions, but at what I find most important. And then I go and find uh, institutions that uh, can enable me to achieve my goals, mm-hmm. which is an entirely different way of approaching uh, the field of journalism. Uh, another assumption was that journalism um, was a profession and a mode of communication, but not a way of life. So this enabled them to close the door uh, in the evenings, for instance. So I'm just doing a craft. I'm not uh, living a lifestyle. And this makes all the difference for the for the journalists, especially in this COVID uh, situation that we're now living, uh, all of us. And the last one was uh, obviously that uh, freelance journalists freelance journalist who made it uh, uh, spoke of themselves as entrepreneurs or at least having some kind of entrepreneurial spirit Mm. so they were always looking for chances and and innovations to make it work within within the news industry and Uh, your second question what is uh what is missing mm -hmm. i think uh i've read uh, maria and erwa read your most recent papers and in both papers uh you mentioned that context matters when doing 
uh, research on precarity. So that's why it's useful to talk to, uh, for instance, Dutch freelancers in the Dutch context. And uh, Maria, you just said that uh, the media industry is like the canary in the mine. Mm. And I'm also interested in the context of the mine. So freelancers are uh, using various strategies to make it work uh, in the news industry. But what are they uh, specifically navigating in specific, let's say, let's say, uh, national context? Because um, Maria, you just talked about that that um, some freelancers do not uh, freelancers in Sweden do did not get benefits because of the COVID situation. And Erwin, you were also talking about legislation that highly influences the way freelancers navigate their profession. So I think uh, there's a lot of there's a, a big chance to look at the various national contexts and see how how uh, dogs <laughs> yeah, sorry, by the yes. dog. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's such a beautiful dog. He um, always comes to say hi. Sorry. Yeah. How how national context influ uh, contexts influence the way uh, freelancers can navigate their profession? Yeah. yeah. So so I mean, talking about that context, uh, and maybe I'll, you can say something about that as well because. You found um, as one way of, of 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 perhaps also as kind of a mental model what Aaron talking about. It, it, you call it a, um, um, and I'm not quite sure if I if these two things are exactly related. But um, you talk about a class ideology that you found among the journalists that you talk to and and, and that you've studied uh, specifically in in a digital context. Um, um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. And I see the overlap as well between um, the, the mental models that you talked about and this idea of uh, class ideology. And in the context of freelancers in particular, this goes back to the point that I made earlier about how we need more research on uh, discourse and the ways that uh, freelance journalists talk about their work because it's the way that they talk about their work, the similar language that I'm hearing from, from everyone in this group today. Uh, it's the similar language, words, terminology that's being used that helps to construct these mental models and this idea of a freelance class ideology. It's through discourse, it's through rhetoric that the, uh, the idea of a freelance class ideology is perpetuated and um, just going back to what a freelance class ideology is, I mean, in, in my work, based on the interviews and other research that I've done, it really does bring together this uh, entrepreneurial spirit, the sense of individualism, um, but also this sense of at least temporary collective um, organizing around particular issues in order to make the individual uh, features, so autonomy, control over the work, to make those possible. Um, and I also found it really interesting that um, we've been talking about legislation in different national contexts. So um, what was said, like, what are freelance journalists navigating in various national contexts? I, I think one of the, the overarching threads here is legislation to help protect them. Um, so legislation to, to make it possible for them to continue doing what they need to do so that they have the autonomy and control over their work. And, and how does, um, how does our work, and we, we've been working on and off on, on, on atypical and freelance journalists and, and workers in general for, for, for quite some time now. Um, we're now living in a sort of unique moment where the other workers, you know, the handful of contracted employees that are still left in media organizations, there aren't that many, um, are, are experiencing somewhat similar sensations as their freelance counterparts do, even though they may still have a monthly salary, but it doesn't take away their sense of precariousness and, 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 and uncertainty of what, what, what's happening and how to, to navigate all the different um, uh, uh, pressures uh, on, on their lives. Um, to what extent can we still maintain 
and or should we still be saying this boundary between you know freelancers on the one hand and contracted laborers on the other hand i mean is there something fundamentally sp specific i mean in in some ways there is of course but 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 especially if we take what it means to be a, a, a journalist, a freelance journalist, beyond simply the fact of, of paying your bills and, and working out the logistics and, and, and figuring out how policies can work in your benefit and those kind of things. And to talk more broadly about, and I think you all talk about it in your work, this notion of entrepreneurial subjectivity, right? More like a, 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 an internalization of just the market model of contemporary capitalist society. Uh, Maria, I think you you talk about it that in your work quite 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 extensively about this, um, um, the, and that entrepreneurial subjectivity is something that is, well, whether it's forced upon or it just happens to everyone in this industry, and that makes, of course, the media industry in part so interesting to study. So so so, is this a matter of taking what we've learned from the study of freelance workers to the entire industry, or is there still something to be said to say, wait wait wait? not too quickly, there's something very particular and crucial about the freelance experience that, that really should inform our scholarship uh, um, specifically. Maria, maybe you want to kick us off? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, th I think yes and no, which is a very <laughs> scholarly answer, right? So both and. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm currently trying to write a paper um, about uh, I call it like a spectrum of precarity where I try to, where I have a set of, uh, of data, whatever field, field study of freelance journalists. And then I have another study that I did of, of life science professionals in thinly capitalized firms. So basically startup. Uh, so people with PhDs in biochemistry and IT and professional workers, but they have very, I mean, they uh, live precarious lives because they, they work in startups where you, need venture finance and you have like six to eight months of venture finance and then you venture capital uh, and if you don't get it then you're out of a job basically so there is this kind of sense of precarity even though they are employed so i'm trying to so i was interested in this question is is precarity linked to this uh, form of employment that freelancing is or is it general so i try to kind of basically take those kind of more objective measurements of, of precarity so uh, economic remun remuneration, so basically level of salary or pay, uh, various access to social security, employment security, can you be fired without notice and so on, those kind of, uh, a couple of measurements, and kind of compare these two professional groups. And I, I would say that yes, they are precarious to a large extent because they, this kind of entrepreneurial subjectivity is enforced upon them. They, they have to, you know, uh, uh, engage in marketing and branding and, and selling of their product. So, so if, you, if you call it that or themselves, but there is also a difference between actually being employed. And here again, I think Erwin's point is really interesting because in Sweden, which uh, the whole system of labor uh, regulation I mean, it's a, a fairly employee friendly regulation. Um, mm -hmm. So it makes a large difference actually, whether you're actually formally employed or whether you're self-employed and may, like a sole business owner, basically. Uh, and I think this difference might be less prominent in the UK, in the US, uh, in, in maybe in other countries as well, because there also employees are more precarious in terms of being, you know, not subject to, to, to labor regulation and so on. So in Sweden, I think there is a difference, but obviously also um, what I think is fascinating about, about entrepreneurial subjectivity is because I experience it so close to home, being a business scholar at a business school where we are measured, we are ranked, we are, uh, I mean, the worth of us as uh, researchers is measured on uh, where do we publish, nobody cares about what, only where, you know, the ranking of the, your publications and how much money you uh, attract in research funding. Nobody cares about your teaching. Nobody cares if you do anything relevant or you know not, or if you're contributing to society. Um, so I mean, uh, so I think it's very interesting to study things that you also kind of feel close to home that you, you experienced firsthand. And I see that of course, 
both for employed journalists and for freelance journalists. This kind of, uh, you know, the entrepreneurialism becoming the company of one and your market value and enhancing your market value always and so on. Yeah. Erwin, how, how, how do you see that? The distinction between freelance and contracted? I mean, it, it, it might matter. I mean, this is, might be typically one of those things that is vastly determined by context. Um, uh, I mean, but but you you mentioned in your um, uh, what you said earlier this about freelancers that actually work in newsrooms and do all kinds of shifts, and so they work side by side with contracted employees, do the same things, but they just have a completely different economic legal standing. And and I think in 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 in, in the book that you and you did, you you identify this big gray area between freelancers and, and contracted labor, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there certainly is a gray area because a lot of freelancers are doing exactly the same work as, as those uh, would even have full-time uh, contract. But at the same time, there are obviously, like Maria said, uh, huge differences in, in, their, in uh, social security and, and uh, they're, they're paid less to freelancers. Mm. What I find interesting is that a lot of labor organization and organization and also uh, a lot of research is, is focusing on how freelancers are organizing themselves in order to uh, to make their circumstances better mm -hmm. but the circumstances of um, full-time employed journalists are also highly precarious so the most logical thing would be that uh, the, the full-timers and the freelancers would work together in order to uh, to talk about the overall structure of the political economy of news work. Mm. And this divide between the freelancer and those who do full-time contract is, uh, in my opinion, really, really obvious in the way full-timers and freelancers talk about their uh, profession. Mm. And also in the way uh, how labor organizations are organized right now. Uh, for example, in in Holland, you have a strict divide between the freelancers branch of the labor organization and the uh, employed branch of the labor organization. And that, that branch is divided in uh, television uh, journalism, newspaper journalism, and a whole lot of other categories. But I think if you look, if you, of course, there are differences, but at its core, mm. all journalists are working in some way in a precarious uh, situation. And I think the full-time employed journalists, uh, I think it's way easier for them to talk to political decision makers mm. because they are organized formally within a, within, uh, within a newsroom or within a, a large uh, news organization. So I think there's a chance for uh, journalists themselves to look beyond the divide and also for researchers to uh, to look closely at the complexities of these uh, differences between the full-timers and the freelancers. Um, and Errol, you've published quite substantially about forms of resistance. Um, 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 how, how do you see this, I mean, this divide working in that context, or do you see more opportunities for I mean, collective organizing, not just among freelancers, but among journalists in general, specific, specifically to, to target these issues of precariousness and what Erwin said about this, the, the polit specific political economy of news work, or is there something else going on here that we should be looking at? Yeah, those are great points. Um, and I, I definitely see some overlap in terms of what's happening in North America and the US and Canada and even in the UK in terms of journalists who are employed full-time, um, working together with uh, freelancers. But I, I, I also see this same divide being perpetuated between the freelance branches of different um, trade unions, kind of within the union, but on their own. And, and I don't mean to suggest that that's necessarily a negative thing. It's, I mean, they, they're freelancers and in many cases, they they have to be treated um, as as a separate branch. Um, but um, we are starting to see more uh, collective organizing, at least in, in Canada, 
between the freelance branch and the employee branch. But to then a certain extent, there are um, trade unions in the United States that, uh, that represent both employees and um, freelancers that are trying to obtain uh, contracts, uh, collective agreements for freelancers. And in some cases, we will see them at the uh, traditionally progressive or left-leaning liberal publications like The Nation or mm -hmm. Jacobin, which secured voluntary collective agreements for freelancers with the National Writers Union. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I still see the, the opportunity for more what Moscow and McCurcher again refer to as labor convergence across media and communication industries with workers who are employees, freelancers within uh, traditional journalistic work, but then uh, other forms of gig work. Um, mm -hmm. But then on, on the other hand, I think it's also important uh, to return to the case of AB5. And, and I, I'm very fascinated by this case because of the way that it's being politicized in, in the United States, um, and particularly with the US presidential uh, election um, this month. Um, we see freelancers aligning themselves with particular political candidates based on how they uh, would see legislation either in support of freelancers or, or not. So uh, I, I'm just wondering as we move forward if um, people are seeing this in other countries, what I'm referring to and working on now uh, as the politicization of uh, freelancing. Um, um, so, so th there's one thing about the politicization of freelancing. There's another thing to take it even more broadly. I mean, Maria, you just referenced um, Judith Butler's work on on precarious life, and 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 Judith and and uh, as well as Andrew Ross and some other authors that have been writing in this area for quite a while, sometimes suggest that. The fact that, and this is exactly what you mentioned earlier, Maria, that that now precarity has become a staple of white color work, even though it was always uh, part of blue color work, um, and that this creates an opportunity for uh, a new kinds of class alliances uh, and, and uh, new new types of 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 maybe collective organizing of of raising uh, issues that cut across not just different parts of the industry, not just because between freelance and, and contractor, but specifically between people who are caught in the web, if you will, of precarious labor um, uh, across industrial sectors. Um, how do we, I mean, is, is, is this the ultimate, I mean, it, it reminds me of an interview I did a long time ago with Richard Rorty, who said that the only real answer to labor's problems is a global union. <laughs> for everyone, um, um, because of course the system that that workers fight against tends to be, you know, uh, supranationally organized. It's not particular to one state or one government or one country. Even uh, we're often talking about corporations and an economic system that cuts across all these kinds of boundaries. I mean, I mean, um, can we translate our concerns and what we observe to that broader level, or do you say that's that's a lovely utopia, but that's never ever gonna happen. Or, or, or are, are things moving? I mean, it, it seems, that's what inspires my question, that there's some movement. Like in the Netherlands, there's, there's more collective organizing among journalists. There's a lot of work now being done, not of collective organization outside of traditional unions. Uh, cooperatives uh, being set up. Uh, um, and and so, so, so is there the beginnings of a, of a, of, a, of, a <laughs> of, of a class spirit there that cut across uh, industries, or or would that be uh, ridiculous? <laughs> what do you what do you guys think, Maria? You want to? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> so, I I would so like to like it for this to be real. I mean, this this idea of the ninety nine percent of all of us. Uh, I mean, 
in a sense, I, I don't want to say that we all suffer equally because I know I'm so extremely privileged uh, as a university teacher and a scholar and so on. But still, there, there is this idea, of course, that, that we're in this together, that there is uh, that the one percent are making uh, tons of money out of all of us, not just the, the traditional day laborers, but, but, but you know, of all of us in the social factory, in a sense. Uh, but the problem is, and I love the idea, and I, I would like to interpret the signs that there is this ongoing movement, and I think there is. There is this idea of us being the 99%. There is ideas of basic income. I mean, we, we're starting to talk about this, the vast economic differences that are just keep, keep on growing even in the, in the industrialized world. Uh, but, but there is this problem again of, of you know, how do we resist something that we have no face of the of the be of the people oppressing us it's just a, a vast global capitalist system uh, and we don't have anyone to actually point our um our you know we don't have any demands because what could they be and we don't have anyone to point them at or to direct them at and i think that's the main issue i mean if we're going to organize ourselves, we need to have a program, right? We need to have a couple of points of which we want to see happen. And how will that actually come to be in this kind of global uh, post work, uh, whatever we call it? So I think maybe even if, even though it is a great idea and I, I hope for it to happen. I mean, this it's on my Christmas wish list. But um, I, I still think that what Errol is perhaps talking about, you know, how, how we maybe still need to have traditional organizing in terms of unions, and they might be able to be a little bit broader than they used to, not just employed journalists or not just freelance journalists or not just writers. Uh, but I still think that it's hard to organize something against, uh, against something where you don't have a face and you don't have a list of demands, basically. And, and that list of demand needs to come from, from a, a group of organized people who actually share the same kind of, uh, well, demands. Errol, Erwin, would you care to respond? Well, um, I think uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, last year, uh, for the first time, a group of freelancers uh, banded together uh, against the, the uh, newsroom of a quality newspaper, demanding higher rates. And I think that for me exemplified that there is more awareness of the fact that freelancers are not alone in their situation. And, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, to expand this awareness. Uh, so, because in, in, in your work, uh, Errol, I read that, that individuals, when they talk about precarity, they, uh, they say something like, uh, I know there is a precarious situation, but I'm not as precarious as, as all those other poor people or something like that. So I think uh, what we see now is the spread of the idea that we're facing a serious situation and uh, the more people talk about their precarious situation, the more it's normalized to, to, uh, to be vulnerable about it and to really face the situation instead of uh, putting it away mm -hmm. and, 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 and looking at others who are doing worse than, than you are. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, what's happening right now in the Netherlands. And I know that's a, that's a far cry from, from a global union, but I think uh, most revolutions started with awareness and uh, awareness and the idea that uh, the situation was so serious that it's worth fighting for. So I think that's mm. the vibe I'm getting now. Harold, <laughs> <laughs> you want to you catch yeah. that vibe as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um... Now, I think there's a few things to go off here. I, I wanna uh, return to what Maria talked about earlier. I'm really fascinated by this idea of a specter or a spectrum of uh, precarity because we can, we can even see the spectrum of precarity not only um, across labor markets and uh, across journalism, but within freelancing itself. 
Mm. And then this this also just goes back to what uh, Erwin was saying um, uh, in, in reference to my own work as freelancers talking about the fact that that you know uh, a freelancer will say I'm not as precarious as that other freelancer over there. Um, and I, I think this helps to just put, so on the one hand, to perpetuate the, the sense of precarity within uh, freelance media work. Um, and then on the other hand, um, it, it also justifies the need for more uh, collective organizing. And that's why I, I like to focus on, on language, uh, discourse, mm -hmm. and rhetoric, and that sort of thing. Because just, just because someone says that, that they're they're not precarious doesn't mean that they're not precarious right right um and then going back to the point um about one global union uh, again it's uh this is this is a, a wonderful idea um perhaps utopian but not not necessarily something that can't be achieved but i also want to go back to the point that i that i made earlier uh, regarding um, some recent observations about freelancing being more politicized, at least in, in the United States. And that's why I'd like to look at this elsewhere, um, because it, it, in order to form some kind of global or even national union uh, of just freelance journalists or freelancers altogether, that there needs to be some kind of consensus um, over what they're, they're fighting for. So, uh, so again, going back to what Maria said, like, what, what are the common demands? If the issue is so politicized that there's no consensus over what's being fought over and no agreement on, uh, on, on what people want, um, I, I think this is certainly a challenge, but not necessarily a challenge that can't be overcome mm -hmm. to forming um, a, a global trade union of journalists or, or freelance journalists. Yeah. Great. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, and I, I think, I mean, people like us, at least speaking to one another and exchanging what we found in our particular context um, is, is certainly, I mean, to, to me, that's an, a, a very helpful, ah, another, another animal. Good. <laughs> um, 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 look, we, of course, we can talk so much more. Uh, um, we do also have to sort of um, uh, protect our precarious times. Um, um, I, I would like to conclude with a final question to all of you. It's like, like uh, um, because we're not just researchers, we're also educators uh, in, in, in our, our different ways. And, and, and um, at the risk of overgeneralizing, I, my assumption is, is that uh, my experience until at least is that, that whenever I teach uh, or, or show up for a guest lecture or talk somewhere where there's a lot of students in media departments, that most of the students are there because they want a job in the media, whatever that means, sometimes journalism or film or games or whatever. And, um, and, and obviously now we have important knowledge for them, right? I mean, uh, so, so how, but it also, in my experience, it's quite difficult to, to talk about this with students because on the one hand, you wanna say, well, the reality of work is that it's gonna be precarious and for these and these reasons, and this is kind of what's happening. And this is what I've been, you know, that the important story. On the other hand, you, know, you don't wanna bust their bubble, right? They, and, and, and sometimes I'm hearing from them, no matter what I say, they don't even hear it. It's like, yeah, that happens to other people, but I am really passionate about, you know, yeah. X, Y, or Z. So, so how do you see your work informing your teaching and, and, and teaching of, of students in, 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 in the media and media departments uh, in generally? Like, what is our role? Uh, what should our role be? Um, 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 what kind of strategies or tactics have you used or, or, or what kind of situations have you come across that really speak to this? Um, Aaron, you want to start us off? I mean, you, you <laughs> yeah, we, um, um, uh, I so obviously wrote, wrote, wrote a book about uh, this. It's, it's a non-academic book. So it really practical stories, real life stories of journalists. And a couple of times I've been asked to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do guest lectures at universities. And we also made a podcast about freelance journalism in which we, in each episode, we interviewed a journalist and we asked, how do you make 
the journalism that matters most to you and at the same time pay your rent so just to just to be as, as blunt as possible uh mm -hmm. in in each interview and we interviewed uh a lot of journalists freelancers who made award-winning uh, journalism and uh during these lectures i i used little segments of this podcast so you can hear the emotion in the voices of the freelancers and uh i think that that really resonates with students because it's not just uh, a researcher who is saying that the polit political economy of journalism is is uh, a really is in a really precarious state and you're not gonna make it probably because look at this look at this look at these numbers it's not gonna look at these graphs they're all going down and that uh, that's that's not working <laughs> But uh, the emotion of the individual individual journalist, if you first let them hear what, what it's really like, and then explain in in the context, uh, the context they're living in and how they're trying to make it work, I think that's a, a good way to combine the practical with the academic mm. in this particular case. So that's that's what I've been doing in the past. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maria, I mean, I mean, for you, it's particularly interesting because you're in a business school. So yeah, that... so um, yeah, so I don't actually teach journalism and, and media students. I teach mm -hmm. business students. Right. But I um, so <laughs> so my short answer is I don't have an answer, but uh, I'm an academic, so I always have something to talk about, obviously. <laughs> um, but I think actually what Irvin mentioned in the beginning of this podcast uh, was was how. Uh, how normal people in employed work are now during the corona situation facing the same kind of obstacles that freelancers has always done. And I think that we will see more of that even post corona actually this this idea of you being your own and here again I go back to this idea of us being our own you know brands and um, our you know the business of one and so on we need to organize our careers we need to enhance our Mac market value always and I don't think that only media media professionals will have to do that in the future. I think that most professional workers will have to do that. And also this idea of organizing work outside of organizations. So even though you're employed, you still need to kind of organize your network, organize your clients, organize your, you know, your, your market or your relations so that you can enhance your, your market value, if you put it like that. So I think that, um, these things will have to be taught to all kind of professional educations and not perhaps only to media. Mm. Students. Yeah, great point. Errol, how, how do you apply these lessons learned? Yeah, uh, for, for me and my work, I think it, it's important in, in my teaching to draw awareness to the fact that um, media work is precarious but not just to end with the critique as you might see uh, traditional political economists do, but also to encourage my students to uh, pursue what they love. So uh, pursue their passion and labors of love, but also to draw awareness to the rights and the working conditions that they're going to face. So that's not to discourage them from pursuing this type of work, but also uh, drawing attention to the professional associations and the labor organizations, um, how to navigate contracts, for example, as freelancers. So it's not just about um, drawing attention to exploitation and the different skills that they need to do the work, but also trying to navigate um, the, the legal aspects of, of their work, especially if they're going to be starting off um, as interns or apprentices um, or, or freelancers. Um, so I think that is our responsibility as, as educators, not just to push them out there and say, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be precarious, uh, best of luck. Um, and that might just discourage some students altogether from mm -hmm. pursuing media work after they graduate. Um, so for me, I, I think we need both sides. Uh, we, we need both to highlight the uh, exploitative side, but but also um, the positive aspects of collectively organizing um, and being able to protect those things that we like so much about doing media work. Um, and then the other aspect to this uh, relates to what er Erwin said about interviewing journalists. For me, it's important to, to bring in guest speakers uh, into my classroom 
Um, so it's not just about me talking about stuff um, in my own uh, research, it's actually bringing my research into the classroom. Um, right. Well, I'm, I'm teaching a media work module, in fact, next term at the University of Huddersfield, and we'll have a series of guest speakers from different aspects of the media industries. So film, television, journalism, of course, and so on. Great. Yeah, that's a module I'd love to take. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, thanks so much, all of you, for your time um, in, 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 in Sweden and Canada and the Netherlands and over here in the UK. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to, 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 to get to talk to you all together. And, uh, um, um, and I'm going to look forward to, to all the new studies and reports that are coming out uh, of the important work that all of you are doing. So, so, so thanks so much uh, for being here uh, uh, today. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Sure. And nice cool. to meet you guys. <laughs> yes.